renal dialysis costs tens of thousands of dollars per year a year per patient. And as we just heard, the condition it treats, end-stage kidney disease, is commonly caused by diabetes. Now a group of Australian researchers has modelled whether a new class of drugs could stave off end-stage kidney disease, saving lives as well as money. The drugs are called sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, or SGLTI2 2Is for short, and they're a shift away from simply managing blood glucose, which is how diabetes is generally treated now. One of the people looking into this is Professor Jonathan Shaw, a Deputy Director at the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute. Welcome, Jonathan. Good afternoon. Diabetes treatment, like we said, is usually about managing glucose, but these drugs work a little bit differently. What are they and what do they do? Yeah, so this is a uh, relatively new class of drug. We've been using it now for about seven or, for about seven or eight years. And um, whilst when we first started using them, we thought that they were a sort of a, just an, another option to uh, manage the blood glucose. It turned out that uh, when uh, the trials started coming in, that in addition to lowering glucose, they had this profound effect on heart disease and on kidney disease, uh, something that was quite unexpected, um, but certainly very welcome to see. Um, and it really has changed the way that we think about uh, what drugs to use for what people and what we might be able to achieve with these uh, agents. They still do manage your blood sugar, though, don't they? So is there still a place for antihypertensive cholesterol-lowering drugs in people with diabetes? Uh, absolutely. These, these drugs don't replace um, other things. So it's really important to control blood pressure. It's really important to control cholesterol. It's very important to control blood sugar. But we're now seeing through mechanisms that, to be honest, we don't really understand. Um, we're now seeing that uh, that these drugs have effects beyond all of those things and, and further reduce the risks, particularly of heart failure and also of kidney failure. Right. So why do we need to be looking at drugs at all? I mean, couldn't we be doing more to just prevent people from getting diabetes in the first place with lifestyle interventions and, and those sorts of things? Um, we absolutely need to be doing that sort of thing. So there's, there's, there's just no doubt that that's a good thing to do, a valuable thing to do. But whatever we do um, in that space, we're always going to have people who, uh, for whom it doesn't work, um, people who can't make the changes that are required. And, you know, perhaps we've even seen this in the, you know, the COVID vaccine space at the moment. If, if you, you know, if, if you don't back enough horses um, in, in the race, you, you can get stung um, when, you know, when you run into problems or, or the, the expected limitations of any single strategy. Um, and, and so um, we, we certainly need to do both things. And the other thing about it is that diabetes prevention, and, and this really applies only to type 2 diabetes, but prevention of type 2 diabetes is a great investment in the future. But according to our modeling, it's, it's an investment in the somewhat distant future. And, and that's because in the next 10 years, almost everybody who will develop uh, kidney failure as a result of diabetes has already got diabetes. Uh, they've probably already had diabetes for several years now. So um, the dividends from diabetes prevention uh, certainly won't apply to everybody and definitely are not going to apply, at least for kidney failure, for at least 10 or 15 years. And that's what our modelling showed us. And if we want to um, make an inroad into the uh, increasing numbers of people ending up on, on dialysis and requiring uh, kidney transplants, um, we have to do something else. Right. So it's a diverse portfolio that you're looking at. So the other two, so you looked at the a large lifestyle modification program for diabetes inter intervention, a sugar tax and widespread use of these SGLT2Is among people with diabetes. What did, what sort of results were you seeing at different time increments uh, in your, pro in your projections? So what we found was, uh, and this you know, wasn't a surprise, but the, the, the drugs work quickly. You know, within a few years of getting increasing uptake in the numbers of drugs, um, we're starting to see um, 20, 25 percent reductions in the numbers of people ending up on dialysis. Now, that's, of course, assuming that um, in, in, in the case that we did, we assumed that 50 percent or maybe um, even better, 75 percent of people who are sort of heading down that track towards kidney problems were getting onto these medications and staying on them. Um, you know, whether that happens in reality is another matter. We were modeling what would happen. Um, when we looked at what would happen with 
um, uh, the lifestyle intervention, whether that's a sort of a personal individual based lifestyle intervention or whether it's uh, uh, something like a tax on sugar sweetened beverages, um, it took 10, 15 years before we started seeing a benefit. Now, what we also saw was that um, after the first um, five to 10 years of uh, increasing benefits for the uh, medication use, that started to plateau off as it was sort of somewhat overwhelmed by increasing numbers of people um, with diabetes. And so that really tells us that it has to be a package deal, um, that we need both components of this. We need to treat people who have diabetes and we need to do everything that we can to prevent future people developing type 2 diabetes. Because we are seeing an upward tick in the trajectory of diabetes incidents in Australia. What's the status of these drugs at the moment in terms of uh, who they're approved for? Um, well, at the moment, um, we have these approved and it's just changed in, in the last few weeks. Um, we're now seeing these approved for use in people with uh, diabetes, with type 2 diabetes, um, and with al already some degree of uh, kidney dysfunction. Unfortunately, at this stage, that is not all backed up by um, Medicare. Um, so for access to these drugs for Medicare at the moment, um, it's only possible for people whose blood sugar control is not good enough. And that really brings us to this sort of paradigm shift that we have. These are drugs that work for preventing uh, kidney failure and also heart failure in people with diabetes and they seem to do that irrespective of their overall blood sugar control but at the moment we're somewhat restricted we can only use them in people whose blood sugar control isn't good enough and that's sort of on the old paradigm of they're just for lowering blood sugar now we know they're just for a lot more than that right i've uh, watched this space professor jonathan shaw thanks for joining us on the health report tonight thank you Jonathan Shaw is Deputy Director, Clinical and Population Health at Melbourne's Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute.